Some of you may have heard of the Great Reset. That's the hiding in plain sight agenda of the World Economic Forum. And that's why so many are calling for a Great Reset. A Great Reset? I just see the need for such a dialogue and I see the need for action. I see the need for a Great Reset. This pandemic has provided an opportunity for a reset. So I, I think this is a time for a Great Reset. This reset, according to the World Economic Forum, aims to improve the state of the world. The globalist organization seeks to capitalize on the so-called COVID-19 crisis, saying there is a unique window of opportunity. This crisis that births opportunity philosophy was perfectly explained by Rahm Emanuel, a pro-abortion career politician who's the former Democratic mayor of Chicago, White House chief of staff to Barack Obama, and in the 90s even served as Bill Clinton's senior advisor for policy and strategy. Emanuel said in 2008, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And what I mean by that is an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. We have a golden opportunity to seize something good from this crisis. Therefore, we have a unique but rapidly shrinking window of opportunity to learn lessons and reset ourselves on a more sustainable path. It is an opportunity we have never had before and may never have again. This is the theme of the Great Reset. And a June 2020 article explains this will consist of new rules governing intellectual property, trade, and competition. In November 2020, this was published by the World Economic Forum as a prediction for 2030. As Daniel Webster remarked 201 years ago, power naturally and necessarily follows property. If you don't have property in capital or in your labor, you don't have power. If you don't have power and you define power as the ability for doing, you cannot be virtuous. Aristotle considered nominally free people who owned nothing as masterless slaves. You must have property to be a full participating member of society. You must have property in order to be able to grow in virtue and become a productive member of society and become more fully human. This is why as Fulton Sheen remarked in his book, Freedom Under God, that private property is the cornerstone of Catholic social doctrine. That it is, so, it is an inherent part of human nature and because power follows property, we must empower every single child, woman, and man to be able to become more fully human because that's the meaning and purpose of life. It's not just to sit back and be taken care of. The church definitively teaches that private property or ownership is a natural right inherent to the human person. St. Thomas Aquinas says, it is lawful for man to possess property. Moreover, this is necessary to human life. Pope Leo XIII says, For every man has by nature the right to possess property as his own. And Pope John Paul II says, A person who is deprived of something he can call his own, and of the possibility of earning a living through his own initiative, comes to depend on the social machine and on those who control it. In the Acts of the Apostles, St. Luke writes, For neither was there anyone needy among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the price of the things they sold and laid it down before the feet of the apostles and distribution was made to everyone according as he had need. Some wrongly conclude from this the early church promoted socialism and was against private property. That's completely wrong. The church has always taught private property is justified as a natural right. The Decalogue commands not to covet anything that belongs to one's neighbor. Our Lord echoes the commandments, including this one, as does St. Paul. That is different than freely choosing to give up one's possessions for the gospel, as the mendicant orders do. Similarly, one can freely choose celibacy for the kingdom, but that does not mean the church seeks to eliminate marriage. It's a sacrament. In a 1903 motu proprio, Fin dalla Prima Nostra, Pius X reaffirms that the right of private property, the fruit of labor or industry, or of concession or donation by others, is an incontrovertible natural right. A socialist state is guilty of coveting and theft, stealing the fruits of another's labor. That being said, Pius X reminds the faithful 
that those who have must be generous in the gospel. Quote, it is an obligation for the rich and those who own property to succor the poor and the indigent, according to the precepts of the gospel. This obligation is so grave that on the day of judgment, special account will be demanded of its fulfillment, as Christ himself has said. At the heart of this agenda is a new world order, a one world government. This idea has been promoted by the United Nations, or the UN, for almost a century. So it's no surprise they've also endorsed the Great Reset. The UN was officially established after the Second World War on October 24, 1945, in San Francisco, California. The seemingly positive conference was attended by 50 governments with the stated goal of preventing future wars. Currently, there are 193 member states in the UN, almost four times larger than it started. Well, there's a time for making plans. And there's a time for action. The time for action is here now. The term United Nations was suggested by Franklin D. Roosevelt, the 32nd president of the United States. This happened in 1942, three years before the UN's official founding when the Declaration of the United Nations was signed by 26 countries, including the US, the UK, the Soviet Union, and the Republic of China. This declaration was largely under the leadership of US President Franklin Roosevelt, UK Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and Soviet leader Joseph Stalin. Although ending the war seemed to be the motive for this United Nations movement, the first page of the 1942 declaration reveals multiple aims, with numerous organs created as part of the UN. In its Economic and Social Council, Population is one of the many commissions. Uh, there has been some progress in reducing the level of, of the birth rate um, as uh, access to family planning has increased. Ultimately, though, they need to have the access to the means of reducing their family size, uh, and, and that comes through access to modern methods of contraception. The whole push for population control, contraception, abortion, is based on a false assumption that there is a limited amount of wealth and the more people there are to divide it up among, the less people will have. This is Malthus. Thomas Malthus, an Anglican cleric, was famous for his late 18th century essay on the principle of population, in which he pushed for population control, saying, quote, population must always be kept down to the level of the means of subsistence. As was shown in the disproofs of Malthus, no, the more people you have, the faster you have economic growth if people have access to the means to become productive. Before technology started advancing, it was human labor. This is why back in the, you know, hundreds of years ago, rulers would actually pay bounties to people to have more children, because that meant more labor. That meant faster economic growth. The roots of the UN go back even further to the early 20th century with President Woodrow Wilson, commonly known as the first globalist president of the United States, who founded the League of Nations, headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. This was the first worldwide intergovernmental organization whose principal mission was to maintain world peace. Although it was established after the First World War in 1920 and only lasted till 1946, this failed global effort was the precursor to the United Nations. Less than a half century later, at the 1992 Earth Summit, the UN put together Agenda 21, a non-binding action plan on so-called sustainable development. The meeting was attended and agreed to by then-President George H.W. Bush, along with 177 other nations. Agenda 21 called for a global partnership where the UN plays a key role. Another key role in this plan included abortion, Population policies and programs should be considered with full recognition of women's rights. Of the 178 nations that adopted Agenda 21, the Holy See, although vigorously opposed to abortion as part of women's rights, was one of them. Also in support of Agenda 21, Democratic representatives at the time, Nancy Pelosi and Elliot Engel. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. Fast forward to the present, and the goals are virtually the same, but less hidden. 
The United Nations and the World Economic Forum both promote numerous intrinsic evils as a means to achieve their goal. Our Lord teaches, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can an evil tree bring forth good fruit. God is infinitely good, he's incapable of willing evil, and our Lord instructs us to be perfect, like the Heavenly Father is perfect, only willing good. Don't confuse this with God bringing good out of evil, that's different. Bringing good out of evil is something, in his infinite goodness, God does by default. He even used original sin, which ushered in the devil's reign of death, to show his love and mercy in an unprecedented way, as said in the exultant of the Paschal Vigil, O happy fault that earned for us so great, so glorious a Redeemer. But that does not mean we can will evil for good or because we know God works to bring good from evil. In his letter to the Romans, recognizing God brings good from evil, St. Paul says those who say, let us do evil that good may come of it, are rightly condemned. The United Nations and the World Economic Forum, two of the biggest promoters of this one world government great reset agenda, have both shown success where the early 20th century League of Nations fell short. But they picked up in the same location where the League of Nations was headquartered. Today in the political realm, the Great Reset is being pushed heavily in the U.S. through mask mandates and the shutting down of the economy, all with the aim of forcing Americans to become more dependent on the government than they already are. And this places the state over all aspects of society, including religion. These forces tell us that we are now the subjects of the so-called Great Reset. Yes, our hearts are understandably heavy, but Christ, through the intercession of his virgin mother, lifts up our hearts to his own, renewing our trust in him who has promised us eternal salvation in the church.